Yeah, man. Wait, wait. Yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you can take your seats, please. So good morning ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Automotive Logistics Europe 2017 uh, which I understand is our 15th uh, Automotive Logistics Europe conference which means I started this conference when I was 20. Oh, so it's going to be this kind of audience is it? <laughs> Just a, a quick question. Uh, I don't know how many of you were around for the very first conference in Montreux. If, if you attended the first conference, if you can just raise your hands. Okay, interesting. So I'm not the only one who couldn't get another job then. <laughs> so my name is Louis Yakumi. I'm the publisher of the Automotive Logistics Group who are publishers of automotive logistics and finished vehicle logistics magazines and organisers of the automotive global series of conferences around the world that are held in Mexico, China, UK, Brazil, Russia, India, the USA and of course here in Europe. And I'm delighted to be back here in Bonn, a beautiful location. And what do you think of the, of the date change to June? If you're wondering why we did it, it's because of the guaranteed constant sunshine in Bonn in June. And also, many of you will know that I'm a, that I'm a fan of the best football team in the world. <laughs> so someone else was right. There are only two of us, Christopher, uh, which is obviously Arsenal. And every year, our conference in March used to coincide with the Champions League. So, uh, so I thought, you know what? In June is roughly when the, the Champions League's final is going to be. So why don't we have the conference just after the Champions League final, when I can come up here proudly as an Arsenal fan. But what I did, we planned these conferences months ahead, more than six months ahead. Uh, and very soon after we started the planning, I found out, I was told that the Champions League actually isn't very important this year. Uh, and actually next year, it's not going to be important at all. So, so that plan didn't quite go to, to plan. Uh, and it's only one year since our last Europe conference. We're just over a year, 12 months. So what could possibly happen in these 365 days that could make a difference to the European automotive and logistics worlds? I've actually started our, our conferences, the last few conferences with that kind of phrase. And looking back, it is, a, it is quite interesting to see you know, what, what kind of has changed on a in a major perspective. Brexit... Uh, obviously, for a start. Uh, there's the small matter of the US election, although I'm not sure what the implications are for the automotive industry. Uh, but perhaps both of the above are a, a move towards protectionism and maybe localization. PSA Opal, uh, and is there more of that, that kind of stuff to come? But what's definitely changed is the is the future of the automotive, supply chain and logistics industries. We've heard about how much the automotive industry is going to change in the next 10 years. Um, and it's not just the automotive industry, every industry is changing. The retail industries, the manufacturing industries with, with 4.0, retail and the expectations of the clients from probably you know, based around the, the Amazon experience. You know, unfortunately, you know, my family and I, we're, you know, we're members of Amazon Prime. So you kind of choose what you buy on the basis that it can be delivered the next day. And now we found out that it can be delivered the same day. And just found out, you know, got an email a couple of days ago that what we ordered can be delivered in two hours. Uh, that's the expectation uh, of customers nowadays. So what do we do or what do you do? What do you have to do differently to, to kind of live up to this? So as our conference theme reflects, your supply chain and logistics has to be connected, smart, and flexible. I recently asked some car makers what they want from their LSPs in the future. And maybe the answer in the past used to be, you know, cost reductions, lean, you know, bringing in more efficiencies. 
But the overwhelming answer this time around was they want them to be smarter and innovative. But also when researching conferences, all of our events globally, it's obvious that the next wave of automotive logistics can't be done by one individual or even one company alone. It will be done by the industry working together and, and collaborating. Last year at this conference, I said that 2016 was going to be the year of the fun conference. And you guys uh, did a great job of making sure that the conference last year was, was a good and, and fun conference. But for this year, for 2017, the theme for our conference is, is bringing people together. I know that, that should be the basis of every conference in every industry everywhere. But this, this year, there just seems to be more a need for it and where the theme has more relevance. For here, it's probably to make sure that the whole industry works together to change and improve. Uh, your customer, whether your customer is the end buyer if you're a car maker, or if your end customer is, is the car maker or a part supplier. Your customer is not looking for tweaks and small steps. There is now an expectation uh, that, that that's our basic job, to, to find small tweaks and improve things a little bit. Uh, someone told me earlier today, the kind of Kaizen is our basic, that's our basic job. That's the, the least expectation we get. What everyone's looking for now is game changers. And that's, that really means everyone working together. I've never had so many requests from different parts of the industry to encourage more meetings between car makers and car makers, car makers and part suppliers, uh, part suppliers and part suppliers, and of course all of the above uh, with the logistics service providers. So you will hear, you'll hear from people over the next couple of days on, from the car makers, part suppliers, LSPs, and also some outsiders to the automotive industry, to hear what can be done to make sure that automotive logistics in the future is ready to support the automotive industry of the future. <clears throat> Amongst those companies who are uh, preparing for change and to support you in the future include our sponsors. <clears throat> our gold sponsors, Adam Pohl, Sayit, CF Rinkins, uh, DSV, Evolution Time Critical, FedEx, Priority Freight, UECC, and Volga Denep, our global sponsors, Changju Logistics, CDC, CHEP, and Jeffco, the so-called, they're called the global sponsors because they sponsor our conferences around the world and have services to support you globally. And our silver sponsors, Forflow, BLG Logistics, Cabcar IPS, DS Smith, Evos Cargo Care, Inform, Orbis, Proact, Royale International, and VMT Ecopack. They all have products, knowledge, and people to support your industry. So visit their stands, read their literature, and meet their people. Automotive Logistics Europe is also part of the Automotive Logistics Live program, which means that, firstly, the conference is being streamed live across the world. You can also use the app to ask questions and make comments to the whole audience. And you can even send direct messages to other attendees. So please, you know, it, it's been, we used it last year as well, please, so please log on to, to see how to use this service. You can see the instructions in the printed program, uh, and the inside front cover. You'll also see the, some of the information on the screen. So, you know, have a look. Please join, join that discussion. It's, uh, we'll be using it later on for some voting surveys. Uh, we'll be using it as part of our evaluation of our conferences as well. So really take advantage of every, every part of the conference. Uh, by using that, that app as well. But most importantly is what you do in the room. Our conferences are not lectures. They're interactive with questions and opinions in the sessions too. And if the, if the noise during the cocktail reception is anything to go by, I'm sure this will continue in the conference. There seems to be a real good spirit amongst everybody. You'll also see red and green cards on your tables. Uh, those are used for kind of, you know, a little bit less sophisticated, less sophisticated, uh, Q&As. Um, you know, I talked to her about the survey questions that we'll, we'll be asking uh, via the app, but maybe here's a chance to test the red and green cards as well. One of the voting survey questions last year was that, or, or the answer was that the overwhelming require, requirement of an LSP was cost reduction. So I'd like to ask you, and if you can use your red and green cards in front of you, if you think that uh, cost reduction is still the main requirement of an LSP, uh, then please, please raise the red side of the card. 
If you think the main requirement now is innovation and new ideas, then please raise the, the green side of the card. So if you can raise the cards now. Okay, thank you very much. I should have said earlier that I'm actually colour blind. <laughs> but there were lots of cards being waved, which is good. No, the overwhelming was, was green. So uh, we've, got a, you know, we've got a good smattering. There's over you know, 100 uh, car makers and parts suppliers here. So hopefully they were very representative in the answer. And it wasn't just logistics providers uh, trying to prove a point. But it was overwhelmingly green. Uh, there were some red cards, of course. Uh, but uh, it was overwhelmingly green. So that's, that's good, because that is what the, the conference is about, is to talk about innovation, moving forward, sharing, uh, sharing new ideas. We'll also be using iPads, which are scattered around the venue, to get your views on individual sessions and the conference as a whole. We'll be, we won't be using the paper evaluation forms this year, so please use the iPads. Uh, the members of our team will be directing you and asking you to use the iPads. So uh, please, if you, if you see one of the iPads outside, there'll be kind of signposted so you know which ones they are. Uh, give us your thoughts on it. They'll be available after every session, so we want your opinion on every session. Uh, and then, of course, your, your opinions on the, on the conference as a whole uh, before you leave. As always, your opinions are very important to us. Uh, we've got a great two days ahead of us. Uh, We've got you know, some amazing forward-looking sessions with some great speakers, an amazing gala dinner tonight at the God Gottesberg Bonn with some special uh, entertainment laid on. Um, I say we listen a lot to your requests, uh, and we do take them seriously, but unfortunately, despite the many requests that we've had for the gala dinner, we'll be not take, we won't be doing what the biggest suggestion was. Christopher and I will not be doing a full Monty at the gala dinner tonight. Uh, well, not while we're sober, anyway. <clears throat> and don't think about leaving early tomorrow, as we have the very popular automotive logistic think tanks tomorrow afternoon and the great final panel discussion with some of the leading VPs in the conference, the IPs at the conference. So please be ready uh, for a great two days. Be ready to learn, network, share ideas, build contacts. If there's anything any of my team can do to help any of you, please let us know that. That's what we're here for. Uh, and hopefully, somehow, we'll still have... Uh, we'll still keep a little bit of last year's spirit and we'll still have a little bit of fun as well. But now on to the important part, on to the sessions. We've got a great uh, session to begin with, uh, which is looking at some you know, kind of macroeconomics, looking at the bigger picture on, on what's happening in the automotive industry and an in, and important sector of the industry, the, the suppliers. From, uh, from PwC and also from, uh, from CLEPA, the, the Suppliers Association. So I'd like to welcome up to the podium the first speaker of the day, Christoph Sturmer, the Global Lead Analyst for Autofacts from PwC. Christoph. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good to be back. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, not a logistics guy, not a, an OEM guy, not a supplier guy. So I'm one of the outsiders, as mentioned above. Um, so let's see what the outside uh, view on this gathering looks like. And ladies and gentlemen, I am surprised. Yesterday I came here, everything was cozy and comfy and everybody sort of met old friends and totally relaxed atmosphere. I usually talk to other guys. And the auto industry is in a state of collective, pa collective panic at the moment. So you guys are sort of, I don't know, sitting it out or you didn't hear the bang yet. Something is happening out there and uh, we're basically seeing a whole industry fearing immediate extinction. And um, they are your clients. So let's, let's see what the state of the automotive industry is at the moment, and how come they are in collective panic and you are still so cool. Um, so let's see where, where and if this thing is ever going to work. Where do I point this? Hello? Okay, next slide, please. Um, 
So, the automotive industry is in a trans state of transformation. Um, a couple of years ago, McKinsey came up with the idea of disruption, which is not an industry type of notion, but it's more a product type notion. It's everybody's looking for the disruptive product. Everybody's looking for the next iPhone. Everybody's looking for the next game changer in a product. But what is the next industry? So disruptive is actually not the kind of word that we're looking for. And now we're looking at transformation. Um, transformation is when something changes from state A to state B in such a way that you don't know in stage B that it was stage A before. Like total change, that's what transformation means. And in the way of transformation, um, all the properties that you had in stage A get lost and you need to find new properties to yourself. Um, some of us call it a midlife crisis, but it's much more dramatic than that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, total numbers. Let's look at total numbers. So, this, basically, we're starting from the back. And starting from the back, when we forecasters look at how the automotive industry is needed, is still needed, and will continue to be needed to feed our lifestyle, which is highly characterized by division of labor, by individual mobility, by collective mobility, by shipping stuff around, by shipping people around. It's getting more and more uh, uh, busy out there, and we're going to need more and more cars. So yes, this is a chart that shows 3% growth over the foreseeable future of new cars. Most of the additional new cars, of course, needed in China for China. And this is why I prefer to have this chart with China excluded, because as we discussed last year, China is sort of a floating moon. Um, cars built in China are for the Chinese industry, full stop, because the Politburo totally understands that if you don't keep the competitive pressure high in the Chinese market, prices are going to soar. But they really very much understand that mobility for them is the core prerequisite of continuing their economic growth, so they want to keep the pressure high on the kettle. Um, now, just very recently, BMW acquired a license to ship some of their products out of China to, to, to third-party locations, um, maybe a few, which is good, but that is only the case because BMW already is a world standard manufacturer, so it's not going to be embarrassing for the Chinese uh, uh, government or the Chinese uh, uh, joint venture partner um, to have these products out in the, in the global market. Uh, for the time being, there's basically a big fence around China. No car, goes, no car goes out that is produced in China. Very few cars come in with high taxes. And uh, we're still waiting for the used car market to kick in in China. And for that, the service and after, aftermarket in China. Um, we've done some analysis, and for China, we're looking at, I don't know, 5% annual growth for new vehicle sales. We're looking at about 10% annual growth for, uh, um, let's say, uh, aftermarket services, and we're looking at anything between 20 and 30% annual growth for used car services. So let's see how that's going to come out um, still from a low basis. Yeah, but all the other regions that we look at in terms of, and this is sort of balancing uh, production and demand, everything is slightly positive. But it's not really like, like greatly positive, it's just a little positive. So it puts the automotive industry into a little bit of a catch. So basically, Following this growth or propelling this growth means ongoing investment, ongoing R&D, ongoing new strategies, ongoing uh, um, entering into new markets. So it, uses, it takes a lot of money to just go with the flow and go where the demand is. At the same time, 3% uh, is not really what your, what your investors get up for in the morning. They are more looking at like, I don't know, 10% or 30% from, from some, some software things. So the auto industry is still in a little bit of a catch situation where to get fresh money from. So they need high investments just to follow the growth potential that is out there globally. It's not 
a lot of growth. So what do they do? They try to carve out little pockets of high growth for themselves. The problem is the customer is, has a very shaky mind. And, and we all remember that automotive fashions change rather quickly. And uh, we currently have a change of automotive fashion in Europe. Um, the diesel market share is plunging. It's plunging dramatically in the, in, the, in the private market. It's not so much plunging yet in the, in the, in the corporate market. But look at that. Um, this, this changes some dynamics. So this picture, although it's all cozy and comfy for you, because it says we still need more parts to be hauled around, we still need more cars to be hauled around, um, on the other hand, it says there is growth, but it is really expensive to find those pockets of growth that are actually good enough uh, to put money in. Um, and this is going on for the next four, five years, as far as we can see. It is going on, but it is expensive. Next one. So um, everybody is talking about this transformation, the new type of vehicle that the automotive industry is looking for. So we've had all kinds of acronyms now. Um, Daimler calls it CASE, and we said, well, we talked to Daimler, and, and they said, yes, you can use our acronym. It's cool. When you come with our acronym, it's going to be, it's, um, we're going to market it. And we said, ah, nah, let's, let's try to come up with something ourselves. So we're calling it EC, and we're calling it electrified, autonomous, shared, connected, and young or yearly updated. Why is that? Products, cars in the future will be subjected to so much technological obsolescence that if they want to keep ahead of the crowd, if they want to keep, just be kept contemporary, you, need to, you will want to do something to your car every year. I mean, even today in your company car, when you give it back after three years, that navigation system is an embarrassment. So you would rather have it updated at least once a year. That exhaust control, well, we don't even know if it worked in the first place, but after three years, we're quite sure it doesn't work anymore. Um, so the, the, the necessity of keeping cars up to date is going to be much more increased, and this is going to sort of blur the lines between first level manufacturing and then second level after fitting, retrofitting, modular upgrades increasingly, and I'm very much looking forward um, to the next presentation, which may touch on these issues. So we think the next generation of cars is going to be EC cars. And I really like the connotation of this acronym because this EC car is going to be much easier on your wallet because you're not going to have to buy it anymore, take up any credit, but you'll just sign up for it like you sign up for your mobile phone. It's going to be autonomous, so no more worries about scratching your car when you park it or having a parking spot in the first place because it's just going to go and park itself wherever it's supposed to be parked. It's going to be shared. I mean, you share your car within your family anyways, but I mean, if you, if you don't really, if you, if you land in an airplane, let's say in Bonn of all places, like, and um, now you have to call, you have to get your rental car, you have to call a taxi or whatever, no, I mean, next, uh, your app, your calendar app is just going to communicate to your favorite shared car provider, and your favorite shared car provider is going to have a car there for you, blinking, waving at you, playing your favorite music, and you just get in, and it is going to know where it wants to go. It's better than your secretary. It's going to be connected. I mean, that's, that's understood, um, except in Germany, of course. I mean, the, 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 wireless, the wireless system in, in Germany is, is an embarrassment. Um, but let's say more high-tech countries, such as Croatia or Sweden, um, they're quite up to it. And we will have G5 networks there very, very soon. Um, so things are actually going to work there. And we talked about the upgraded thing. But this is all so different to the tin boxes that the automotive industry is still thinking that they need to build, that they're really scared about this big step to this easy type of cars. They like like heavy machinery type of cars. Um, and this is what drives them. And then on the way, of course, and this is where you come in, there's a lot of interaction between companies, between continents, between countries. And uh, things don't look well. Actually, when we put together all the bad news that we have, and Including the, bad, uh, including the news that we're expecting uh, uh, in the course of today, 
um, it's almost a perfect storm. We have the European Union falling apart. We have a totally new type of government in, in the US, in North America. We have a couple of countries in South America currently in a death spiral. We have ongoing unconventional warfare in the Middle East. We have a strife of some of these fiefdoms on the Arabian Peninsula that no one knows where it came from and no one knows where it's going. We have ongoing terrorism in, South, in, in South, uh, Southeast Asia. So, I mean, how bad can it get? Still, stocks are up, everything's cozy, people are buying, moods are high. What's going on? Next one, political instability. Yes, uh, we just talked about it. Migration streams. We have people drowning in the Mediterranean now as we speak. People that took, that sold everything they had to walk through the Sahara and then put, get put on this boat and guess they're going to be fish fodder. And this is, and we're just sitting here. So the world is not in a good state. Um, the environmental factors. We're just seeing the Paris Accord that I admit some of us had a hard time understanding its relevance. We're seeing the Paris Accord being shot down. Um, okay, there are grassroots movements, of course, who are trying to oppose this, but um, I have kids. I want my kids to have air to breathe. Um, so um, what do we do about this? And then finally, of course, we're talking about all the micro issues new types of industry, new types of collaboration, new types of products. So it couldn't almost be worse, um, but uh, let's see where this takes us. Let's focus in on Europe, just a short update. First quarter, most of you have seen, was really cool in terms of uh, GDP growth, GDP outlook, not too bad. Um, on the right-hand side, I included the long-term average line um, for um, economic sentiment, and we're seeing that, um, except for the grudgy Germans who are always in a bad mood, even, even when their economy is growing, it's, it's like really cool out there. People are having a good time, and people are being very optimistic about what's going on, including, including the UK. Um, the dotted line is Italy. Um, things are going better in Italy, so the mood is fine, and, and the good mood helps a new vehicle sales. Um, we still think that 2017 um, will continue this, this upward uh, roller. Um, and now we're looking at this bar chart that you all know from your uh, stock shareholder analysis. So we're still not at the top of where market uh, take up can go in terms of vehicles um, in many markets. Now, for the, at, at this very point in time, and we discussed this yesterday, I think for the moment in this quarter, we have a little bit of an overheated situation um, in the European uh, industry because, yes, we have many manufacturers that planned for very high diesel sales. And the diesel sales are not coming, but they're still producing them. So we see a lot, we see some tactical movements here for, for getting the diesels into the market. Um, we think, um, I heard stocks are full, parks are full, dealers are full. So. Um, Maybe there's going to be a little bit of a rethink in the second half of the year. Um, first of the year has been, has been quite good, but there's some dynamic. On the other hand, though, and uh, there are structural factors that let us think that there's still a lot of upward potential in the European market. If we look at average vehicle age in the European markets, it's anywhere between 9 and 10 years, and that's average age. Average scrapping age in European countries is anywhere between 17 and 20 years. So that's when the, the old cars get off the road. And European governments have a big problem meeting their CO2 commitments. So where do you go? You go to the old cars. If any government, or even maybe the collective of all European governments, decided to do something about old gas-guzzling cars, we, need, we, have, we will have a lot of new car demand on the, on the new end. Um, Let's see when this is going to happen. Um, I think um, some governments uh, will have to take actions and they will take actions. So while on a short-term analysis, the current structure of the market is, is a little bit overheated, I think when we look at park renewal, um, things, things may go um, upwards. Um, 
This is sort of the overall outlook. Again, the outlook is feeble growth, a little bit of growth. So everybody is struggling for that 1% of growth and is putting a lot of money into it. Yeah, in terms of production, again, same picture. We had a big scare that production is going to go, is going to be siphoned off into Turkey, is going to go to Africa, is going to go to India, and then you guys have to carry all these cars around. It's not happening. Um, Europe is still a location that is defending its overall capacity. There are even upgrades. I mean, we had just had this massive upgrade in Ingolstadt. We're having this massive upgrade in Gjör. Um, we have uh, Daimler upgrading their Hungarian factory. We have a VW building a new factory for vans in southern Poland. We have Jaguar Land Rover installing something quite massive um, in Slovakia. So there is new capacity added. Um, other capacity is upgraded. So in total, we, it, it looks quite stable what um, the outbringing of cars uh, looks like. And then we just... Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for mentioning this. The OEM landscape in, in Europe is getting much more interesting all of a sudden. The PSA, GME uh, merger, um, I just uh, put it out for you. So what it, the future PSA group um, currently has a forecast of 3.3 million units uh, produced in Europe um, in the year 2023, up from 3.1. That is quite a massive customer. I know Jeffco has a hand in that, but maybe you could just uh, work with those guys. Um, uh, but um, then we have, I don't know who, who, who's reading the news in that. So um, Lotus is currently just being bought uh, by BYD together with Proton in Malaysia. That's also a very interesting thing. So this is this Volvo bracket type of, that's the Chinese owner of Volvo, and uh, no, Geely, sorry, Geely. And uh, so they're, they're getting in there. It's, 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 it's an interesting constellation. Um, we're, we're seeing Borgward making moves to establish uh, production uh, in Europe. We're seeing Tesla under pressure to upgrade their activity in Tilburg. Um, so the OEM landscape is actually getting a lot more interesting. Your account managers will have more to do, already have more to do than they had than they had up to now. Um, uh, Europe is no longer a boring place with 2% growth, but it's a highly interesting place with 8% growth as last year. Um, and of course, with little meek growth on the top line, we're looking for pockets of high growth, and the pockets of high growth are, of course, alternative drivetrains. Um, electric vehicles, fully electric vehicles, are sort of just coming on. Those of you who have uh, Nissan and Renault uh, as their accounts, uh, you already have quite a lot of electric vehicles to haul around. The BMW account doesn't have as many as expected, but still a, f a few. Um, so um, it is moving up. Full hybrids are getting more and more interesting. So this is a pocket of growth that everybody is, especially on the OEM side, is flocking into because this is where growth is. This is where there's more than 1% growth. Finally, topic of the day, um, the UK. What is this Brexit thing going to do? And we just look at the statistics of the glorious uh, um, British car industry. We still have the 2015 statistics because the SMMT has not, has not finished counting uh, their 2016 results yet. So um, 2.6 million cars registered in the UK. 1.6 million cars built in the UK, 2.4 million engines built in the UK. Uh, there's a couple of major engine factories there, as you know. And then of those 1.6 million, 1.2 million vehicles were exported. That's a great customer. That's cool. 1.2 million off the island. Um, which leaves, and now just follow me a little bit. Um, you produce 1.6, you export 1.2, that leaves 400,000 on the island. Still, you have 2.6 million new registrations, which means that 2.2 million cars need to be shipped on the island, which explains why there are so many ports um, on the island. Um, 
which then again casts a little bit of doubt on the actual depth and, 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 and sort of force of the UK industry. And I've been looking around, I've really made an effort to try to find a major supplier that has a major operation in the UK. I haven't found any. Um, I've found a couple of just-in-time, just-in-sequence pre-assembly shops near to the factories like seats, bumpers, um, uh, dashboards and that kind of stuff, but like real heavyweight tier two suppliers, can't see any on the, on the on, 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 in the UK. So actually, the UK appears as, as much more of a nearshore final assembly location than sort of a deep grounded automotive industry location. And that sort of changes the dynamics when we look at it. So that puts the UK, in spite of its glorious history, much more in the, in the area of, let's say, Turkey or uh, uh, Morocco as a competitive location than Germany or France or Italy with their deep-rooted automotive industry. And, and with this in mind, um, this is, uh, I just want to add this chart. Uh, we, we plotted it out. Where do cars come from? Where do cars go? So UK is really a big turntable for parts that are being assembled into cars and then go out. There's a big stream of mutual connection uh, with South Africa, actually. There's a quite a, an important stream of import from South Africa because they're used to building cars with a, with a steering wheel on the wrong side. Um, uh, there's, uh, but the rest is, is, is clearly um, mainly into the EU. Um, not very much into China, and uh, quite a lot um, into exotic regions made, uh, in Asia and Africa. Um, so where do we see the UK assembly, and I'm, I'm really making a point of saying assembly, uh, going? It's tricky, because it's not just about one fact. It's not just about customs. It is also about the currency. And the currency, the devaluation of the pound, is part of the explanation why currently the UK factories are fill, filled up to the brim, because it, it's so efficient to build there. Um, you hold the parts in, you have assembly costs, you have wage costs, you have energy costs that are quite affordable because the pound is so low, and then you ship the cars back out, um, sell them at a good margin. So. The, the, the current position actually is very, very favorable for the UK industry, my humble opinion. I hope we're going to have a discussion on that today because there's full access to the free trade area plus a low uh, exchange rate makes it a very favorable uh, assembly location. So, And in the future, we have two factors. We have the customs regime and we have the exchange rate. Is the exchange rate ever going to go back up again? Hmm. Let's see. Um, if all the bankers get pulled out of London, um, so the pound is no longer going to be one of the major financial markets trading currency, that's going to reduce demand for pound. So there, there's, there's a connection between where the city bankers go and where the pound goes. Um, so if the pound should ever soar, of course, it wouldn't make sense to assemble so many cars there, but it makes a lot of sense to sell cars there. So there you have two reasons to pull capacity out of the UK. You pull the capacity out to cheaper production locations and then sell the cars there at a good price. That's for a high exchange rate scenario. Low exchange rate scenario is just the opposite. There may be capacity that, makes, that actually makes sense to be shipped in, except the EU comes through with its uh, strong stance on the UK and installs high, uh, high customs rates. But they can't do uh, very high customs rates. They can do WTO customs rates, which is 10%. Um, and 10% uh, is something that you can still work with because uh, I wouldn't assume that the UK government would install customs on the inside. On the, on, the, on the import, but it would merely be the EU, the EU installing uh, customs rates. So it's um, currently totally undecided. Um, I think, I hope, and maybe we're going to hear some of that, 
that the automotive industry will use their CLEPA bodies, will use their um, ASEA bodies to inject some, some reason into this discussion, especially on the automotive sector, under the special consideration that the average local content of a British-built car is less than 50%. It is, like 2015, last count is 41%. So it's, uh, you could even make the case an exception case. You could even say that, uh, actually, it's just assembly. We're just adding services, just value-added services um, on the island. So uh, we, we, we wouldn't even need to properly import them and then re-export them. So currently, I have to say, I, I couldn't put my personal money into any, on, on, into any one of these scenarios. Um, given the exchange rate um, connection, given the huge disbalance that we already have between local production and local sales, I think there's a lot of room to upgrade the local for local production, to just keep the production level um, in the UK as it is, substitute imports. So currently, I'll sit on the fence, and my current favorite scenario is the so-called, what we call the South Korea scenario. Uh, we believe sort of in an ongoing, basically flat, flat development of the UK production, um, favorable exchange rate, and some sort of exception regime for the automotive industry in order to avoid um, undue um, taxation. Of course, no one's going to put fresh money into the UK because I think in all it's a little bit unsure where things are going to go. But I don't believe that people would actually start pulling out a lot of capacity in the short term. Last slide. If they would, things could go bad very, very quickly. We did a little bit of a count of how similar the UK production is to production on the continent. And for 16.9% of total summary production over the 2017 to 2023 time horizon, we found that it is the same vehicle produced in the UK and produced somewhere on the European continent. A very good example is the um, Astra, Vauxhall Astra, Opel Astra, um, produced uh, in the UK, produced in Poland. You don't even know where your car comes from. Shifting that capacity is done, can be done in an instant. And uh, I mean, although the Polish cap uh, productive uh, uh, factory is quite full, technically, like theoretically, logistically, it would be possible to just shift the assembly off, like, without any announcement. For almost 50%, we have a product on the UK, in the UK with sort of a very near sibling, a platform sibling built on the continent. So when you have two products that are on the same vehicle platform, that is the same underbody, you will have the same or very similar processes. You will have the same or similar conveyor systems. You will have the same or similar measuring, measurements. You will have the same or similar suppliers. So basically, shifting a product from one location to the other when it is a, a, a platform sibling takes a year. So taking a decision now to shift a platform product from one location to the other could have it, could have it elsewhere within a year. That's 50% of total production. Then we have sort of uh, a, a manufacturer sibling production. So we have manufacturer group A, a factory on, uh, in, in, uh, in the UK and on the continent. So they wouldn't have to look for a new location. They wouldn't have to look for new staff. They wouldn't have to look for uh, new infrastructure. They wouldn't have to look for new LSPs. They could just say, okay, we, we enlarge the factory. We call that a brownfield approach, basically, or a factory enlargement approach. How long does it take to, to, how long does it take to actually build a factory? You all know it takes about two years. Um, so after two years' time, even those remaining 25% 
of uh, the UK industry could be shifted out to the continent. And then only 10% of the UK industry, of UK assembly, is proprietary. Like, only within the, the, the wider European arena, products are only built on the island. There is no platform sibling. There is no other factory of the same manufacturing group on the continent. It takes about three years to scout for a new location and build a new factory. So if everybody today, after today's election result, takes the decision to say, okay, I'm out of here, technically within three years, production could be wiped off the UK. So any scenario that is not that would mean that people, that an OEM would have to strategically decide to not get off the island. So this is where um, I think, I mean, the, the, the situation could be very dramatic, and I'm quite sure that politics, um, especially on the, in the UK, understand that it is not good to keep uh, the automotive manufacturers in an unsure state uh, for very long because decisions need to be taken and they need to be, need to be taken fast for the next product generation. Okay, um, not trying to, sp to spoil your mood, um, this is all fine um, in terms of having uh, logistics demand, but please understand your customers on the, on the manufacturing side, they're having a very bad time. And if you can sort of help them um, with their current worries and their upcoming worries, I think uh, you're in for a good time uh, to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christopher. Uh, a great kickoff to the conference there, giving us a lot of information. Um, so we've got f to look forward to uh, an automotive industry growth climate of kind of, ah, that's okay, <laughs> uh, which is better than it has been sometimes in the past. Uh, what was uh, very strong, and it was very good to hear that detailed explanation there from Chris Christoph was on the Brexit side of things. So again, just a very quick green and red card vote. Um, which one of you, uh, which companies or, uh, have got uh, Brexit plan or working on Brexit plans? Uh, so green if yes, you're working on a Brexit plan, being prepared for Brexit, and red card if, you're, if you haven't really got a plan uh, for Brexit. So again, you know, green and red cards, please. Uh, probably a little bit even, maybe slightly more on the green side, so it's good to see that people are trying to plan for Brexit. Uh, I'm not sure if Theresa May and whatever the government's going to be, whether they would put up a green card or a red card. Or, or they're probably working on plans, but I'm sure they've got no idea what it's going to be, uh, which makes it difficult for all of us. Uh, next, uh, I should also say, just for those of you who are trying to make notes after Christos' presentation, Firstly, the, the presentations in this room, in this main room, are being uh, filmed, recorded, uh, live streamed as well. So if you want to see the presentation, again, they'll be available probably for a, by the end of the day or definitely in the next day or so. And also the slides of most of the presentations will be made available at the end of the conference. We'll be sending you a link to the slides. Uh, so if you couldn't make notes quick enough, you will be getting uh, the, slide, the presentation sent through in a PDF format as well. But next up, to hear the challenges of the, of the automotive suppliers uh, in this changing world, I'd like to welcome to the, to the stage Frank Schlehuber, the Director of Aftermarket for CLEPA, the European Association of Automotive Suppliers. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Also, a very warm welcome from my side and on behalf of the entire management team of Claypa. I have a background 26 years with Bosch, with the industry and the aftermarket business. And when I was invited and asked to show up at the, to show up at the logistic conference, I thought probably it's really worth to share with you some insights. What about automotive suppliers? What do they see as a challenge for the future? You mentioned the word, they are in a bad shape or in a bad situation. 
I wouldn't go so far. We are in challenging times. And with all the negative impacts, what definitely are available, we also see opportunities. And from that side, I would like to give you some insights in that. Kleper, what's it Kleper about? It was founded in 59 and represents 120 companies versus political institutions and represents also 23 national associations. These national associations help us to represent our interests in the Europe 28 still. Whom do we represent? We speak for 5 million employed people in our industry. We represent more than 600 billion in revenues and we stand for 18 billion in R&D spendings. And these spendings, which are even higher on a global scale, where we have about 40 billion in spendings in R&D, these at the end end up in about 50% of all innovation in the automotive world is done by suppliers. Total volume of the business is 1,400 billion in sales, only to give you a dimension what automotive means to the world. This is big business. What are the trends? for the future. And I would like to start with the mega trends. Some of them we heard with the EZ from uh, PYC, uh, PWC, and uh, sure, we have some overlap here. Electrification, connectivity, autonomous driving, advanced manufacturing, and advanced materials. This is what suppliers at the moment chew on. And it's very clear, let's start with the, top, uh, with the bottom here, advanced materials, lightweight materials will increase from a share today of 10% up to more than 60% by 2030. Advanced manufacturing, we are pretty clear that only manufacturers which have the complete process under control will be able to manage external defect costs and warranty costs and to be competitive in the future. This means Industry 4.0 has a clear priority in all our member companies. Now autonomous driving. This is a topic which definitely will not kick in overnight. Our industry sees autonomous driving kicking in after 2025. But there will be a step-by-step -step approach where we add functionalities to vehicles and uh, starts with reducing the driver supervision by 2020 up to the highway assist model or feature which then will become popular. But we will see already other features, uh, valet parking, automated parking, already from 2018. This means this is a re revolution step by step, but it will have finally impacts also on logistic services. Electrification is another major trend at the moment, eats up massive resources, financial resources in our uh, Glaper membership, and at the moment, we saw the figures before, there is not too much business so far, but everyone knows that electrification definitely will have an impact on the entire value chain in the automotive business, and this is original equipment as well as aftermarket. But there is one last thing, connectivity, which might lead to a much faster effect on our industry than we all anticipated, and this is connectivity. Because connectivity is something what happens now, 
new vehicles at the moment driven by the e-call legislation have to be equipped mandatorily from next year, April, with an e-call functionality. Of course, if you have this functionality in a car, you will make use of additional functions out of this basic technology. All new vehicles have the capability to be connected to some place. And this offers complete new ways of customer binding or to reach out to customers to get information from fleets outside back into uh, headquarters and to steer the market and even to reshape the entire value chain. I will later on show you a couple of examples here and uh, go a little bit deeper into that. But connectivity is something what happens at the moment and has the biggest impact in the years to come, in the horizon up to five years on our entire business and this will not walk around also logistic services. On the right side, you see here aftermarket trends. Yeah, there are digitization is a topic. Everyone who is today active in aftermarket thinks about what can I do with big data? How can I make use of it? How can I shape the market? How will I am be impacted by other ones? We see on the other side a huge consolidation. It's not only the OEMs, the vehicle manufacturers, going new ways in direction to the independent aftermarket business. It's also wholesale. The independent aftermarket wholesalers are heavily investing in acquisitions, in mergers, and in their own activities. This means we have at the moment a complete reshaping of the aftermarket. And we see, of course, intermediates coming into our markets, insurance fleets, whoever is sitting on a large amount of customers and thinking about how to make use of that uh, customer base, what additional business models are possible. And then we see, clear, we heard it before, shared economy is the topic and uh, we see less privately owned car or cars owned by individuals. We see more fleets, what at the end ends up in less deciders about repair volume in the market. This means one guy in a big leasing company decides about what to do for 10,000s of vehicles. But what is really the major issue of, I think, OEMs as well as suppliers. All these things happen at the same time. This is what we never had before. We had normally step-by-step -step approaches. We, as a supply industry, emerged from the last crisis, 2008, 2009, even stronger than we had been before. In these days, some of the companies had troubles. We had a strong acquisition phase. And 2009, we had about 36% of the entire volume of uh, automotive uh, uh, suppliers had been in the hands of the top 100 companies. After the crisis, and eight years later, in 2014, about 50% of the entire supply uh, business was in the hands of the top 100. This means we have stronger companies on the supplier side, and the last big example was the takeover of uh, TRW by uh, CF. And uh, I think that consolidation definitely will go on, but at the end leads to financially stronger players and uh, players who can or who have the potential also to play a major role in shaping this market. But is that a guarantee that we survive in future as a supply industry only to invest? I think 
that would be a little bit short-sighted. And we heard one keyword before, innovation. And I think a lot of companies have to think about to reinvent their business model, their customer profile, and their portfolio. And it's no longer, and I see it from a lot of meetings with our members, all our members think about is the portfolio I have today the right one, what takes me into the future? What business model? Is the selling of components still the model or do they need to wrap a kind of service around which at the end is the enabler for making business? Or who are my customers in the future? Is this still an OEM or someone in between? Do I need to uh, uh, contact directly other ones, new players entering this market? And these three dimensions at the moment are really under um, questions in each of our members. Some are more advanced, some are a little bit uh, uh, more reluctant to come up here with uh, progressive ideas, but fact is the market is in a transformation and uh, definitely the next three years will reshape that market much more than what we have seen in terms of change in the last 10 years. Now a few comments to the aftermarket. We have a classical value chain and you as logistic uh, specialists might easily find the spots where logistic services are concerned. This means between suppliers and distributors we will have logistics, between distributors and repairers we have logistics, and uh, between parts manufacturers and OEMs. But what you see here is our two lines. On the left side you see the parts manufacturers which we represent and they supply into two channels. One is retail wholesale, this is the so-called independent aftermarket business and on the bottom you see the so-called original equipment sales, OES business. Original equipment sales normally ended up at franchised dealers, this means a uh, Volkswagen uh, or uh, whatever branded uh, a workshop and uh, on the top part it ended up in a repair shop which uh, is independently operated. What happened in the last five, six years is that more intermediates came into the entire game and uh, this affected both channels and these intermediates like fleets, Leasing, and we should not forget that uh, big leasing companies have a certain mass, a lease plan or a GE, they operate more than one million vehicles, much more than one million, and uh, they are looking for service alternatives and decide heavily on what is done to their property, their vehicles. Insurance steps more and more into the game. Hook in Germany here uh, started to rethink what to do with 11 million customer contracts. Can we offer much more on the uh, workshop side? Means they eat up into that market. This is the status quo today. What happens now as soon as connectivity provides a better predictability of a demand in the future and connectivity allows to reach out to end consumers and to retrieve data from vehicles and uh, analyze them and to make use of them means at the end make a business model around this data and try to steer business. A third line you will see here, this is the first e-commerce uh, activity we will, which we see at the moment at a, I would say, very low level, doesn't have too much 
shares of the entire aftermarket, but with connectivity and the increase of digitization, we will see definitely this also increasing in the future. Let's start with a few from the part supplier side. On the left side, the part suppliers, what are they doing at the moment? They are expanding their product portfolio. Everyone wants to offer nearly everything. And sometimes you wonder what fits all under one brand. And I think the phase of consolidation and acquisitions is not yet over. It's still a process and we will see much more mergers or acquisitions in the month to come. What a lot of parts manufacturers do, especially the more advanced ones, they say, okay, we invest in technologies to reach out to the end consumer. This means they invest in platforms to offer private consumers and fleets a kind of direct access model. This is one thing. Nothing what at the moment uh, is too much successful at the moment or trying uh, in a position to change the entire market, but at least the first attempts are visible. Some parts manufacturers go into a forward strategy and invest either in wholesale and retail or directly in independent aftermarket shops. This means, for example, Bosch is investing a lot in um, the Bosch car service network plus additional concepts, but this is also done by companies like uh, Federal Mogul, by Hella, and uh, ZF as well. This means no one at the moment on our supplier side is happy with being a parts manufacturer alone. Everyone thinks about how can I stretch a little bit the border and uh, expand my activity. I think it was all started by Carl Icahn owning um, Federal Mogul and investing not only in a parts manufacturer, but also invested in large retailers in the United States. This means here one owner, but activities in both channels. Here is where it starts to mix up. What is wholesale doing? Wholesale in Europe is at the moment consolidating a lot. I think the largest company, meanwhile, is no longer a Stahlgruber or a Wessels Müller and Trost, it's LKQ. It's an American-based company, Chicago-based, and invested in REAC, in ECP, and uh, at the moment present in nine countries in Europe and with more than four billion in external sales, uh, the largest automotive parts retailer in, um, in Europe. And just June 1st, we had this other acquisition from uh, Uniselect, a Canadian-based uh, supplier um, or retailer investing in the UK-based uh, parts alliance. Also here, again, money from across the Atlantic coming over to Europe, investing in European wholesale. This means that accelerates also immediately the shift of market power, larger wholesalers, and for us as parts manufacturers, it's meanwhile no longer a difference to sell to an OEM or to one of these large retailers. In the US, the retailers are exceeding 10 billion US dollars in sales after market volume. I think this is pretty much a dimension where some OEM would like to be. This means from the size why, from the size, it's no longer, a, uh, and, and, and the processes and the purchasing uh, uh, power, it's no longer a difference between OEM and independent aftermarket. And wholesale definitely invests a lot in their relation to the workshops in creating competence regarding training hotline and to provide additional service to make the independent aftermarket workshops dependent from their services. 
This is what wholesale at the moment does. And what we also see as a trend, this was triggered by PSA, is that vehicle manufacturers started to invest also in independent workshop chains and in e-commerce channels. PSA is operating Mr. Otto as an e-commerce channel. PSA is operating Eurorepa for um, an independent aftermarket repair network. This means OEMs are now definitely investing in the IAM and these two chains, IAM and OES, are no longer separate channels. They simply are growing together and get a lot of overlap. This will have also impacts on logistic services because these uh, chains are no longer separated. Combinations are here possible in the future and I think the end of that development is not yet achieved. We are, I'm convinced, we are here at the beginning of such a trend. Of course, there are other players. I mentioned before, intermediates. Intermediates are coming into this market and try to route repair business. This means they speak with one voice for a huge amount of vehicles and they are talking to OES channel participants as well as to members of the independent channel. And um, this will have an impact on margins because they are part of it and uh, they will take their cut into the entire game. This means the total margin in our value chain will not be expandable or inflatable. Um, this means we have more players in the game and there will be a heavy fight about margins and the best position in the entire game. On the workshop side, also with an impact on logistics, we will see immediately in the, in the next years definitely a decline in number of outlets. And this means we will have less uh, logistic points in um, the fine logistics. And uh, this is simply driven by the fact that these <coughs> mom and pop shops on the workshop side will disappear, simply driven by the technology which needs to be managed in a workshop, and this is only possible for larger workshops with more um, volume per service bay. So what are the possible scenarios? One could be that OEM take the IM. This is my keyword for that, that OEMs do not longer focus only on their channel, but definitely use connectivity in a way that it's so convenient for consumers to stay in that OEM world and to enjoy over the lifespan of the vehicle service in that OEM channel. Another scenario could be Europe follows the US market. This means wholesale consolidates so fast that they get so a dominant uh, 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 role in the entire European game and uh, at the end are sitting on the interface to the workshop and control this channel totally. The other thing is that intermediates rule the game. Means car sharing and uh, fleet business is really speeding up and with the connectivity capability you can even steer the business much better than ever before and these intermediates start to rule that game and do not leave a lot of room for individual decisions anymore, even get some control over wholesale. Or we see new value chains arising. This means new combinations out of the elements what we have today in our channel, including the new players. Let me come to the end. We will see clearly that the value chain will transform. The two-line approach is no longer, it's already breaking away, 
and it will be reshaped in the next five years. The players involved will be larger. Transparency and predictability of volume will increase and will be relevant to take decisions in that entire value chain. And we will see definitely new business models and new profit pools. This means the capability to go into alliances and to think a little bit across the border of the existing business is mandatory for the success of the future, especially for our members. And we have to accept that new players enter the automotive market and we need a certain openness from each player to embed these and to make use of the opportunities of these kind of developments. And for me it's the question, what role is played by logistic services? And there are two options, either logistics follows the market or even play an active role in shaping this market. And with that question, I'm coming to my end and probably we will find in this conference first answers on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, one of the considerations uh, for my old age is that I'm going to be doing more and more from sitting down in these comfortable chairs instead of uh, standing up there. Uh, so we'll be continuing the, the Q&A from here. But first, I'd like to thank Frank for a very interesting presentation there, uh, covering two very important parts of, of, our, of our world, uh, the part suppliers uh, and also the aftermarket uh, and service, side, service uh, part side of the industry. So I think two very good presentations there that have given us a lot of, a lot of things to think about. Uh, particularly, I, I like that last bit as well, something that we need to do as an industry uh, instead of being reactive to the market. Uh, I think automotive supply chain and logistics has got a very important role. If we take control and be proactive to shape uh, the, the future automotive world and the world that we're going to be acting in as opposed to being the reactors to it. So now it's, uh, it's time for, uh, for the Q&A and the, and the discussion. So uh, the usual rules apply. If you've got a question or a comment to make, please raise your hand. Wait for the microphone to come so that we can hear you clearly. Uh, please say your name and your company name. Uh, and, then, and then, as I said, it could be a comment, uh, agreeing or even ideally disagreeing with the panel or, uh, or, asking, a, or asking a question to any of the panel. So uh, I don't know if anyone who wants to, uh, to get, kick that off with a question. Uh, again, uh, another usual rule is that we have got questions. So don't think by not asking a question you're getting off to, uh, getting off to coffee or, or lunch earlier. Uh, we will still have the discussion. Uh, but firstly, a question from my side uh, to Frank, uh, perhaps on both sides, for the tier ones and the service parts providers. As the new, uh, new drivetrain models come in, particularly electric vehicles, uh, we're hearing that there'll be much, much fewer parts, or many fewer parts, and more modules. So uh, how is this impacting the plans of your, of your providers and what is it, or, or your um, members? Uh, how are they planning uh, for this? Where they're gonna be, you, know, you said there's gonna be consolidation, but uh, firstly, am I correct? Will there be fewer parts? Uh, more modules and what does this mean for the tier supply base and, and of course the suppliers to the aftermarket? Yeah, definitely. There will be fewer parts. You only have to count the engine parts you need to produce a combustion engine and compare them to an electrical engine. And if you see only the size of it, then it's obvious that there are less parts and uh, a lot of parts obsolete in the future. The good thing with the aftermarket is that this is not coming overnight. The share of electric vehicles is extremely low at the moment, and we should not forget that worldwide we have 1.2 billion vehicles out there which need a service also for the next 10, 
15 years. And these parts will not, uh, these, these wings will not disappear. And as long as they are operated, there is a service demand. And this is something where the industry really can have the time to make preparations for that. But in the long end, electrification will definitely reduce the total amount of parts. Mm -hmm. Anything to add to that, Christoph? Yes, I think there are two positives to all these new electric things. Uh, firstly, even today, the main cause for a vehicle to fail is in the electric systems. So the more electronics you put in, the higher the probability that something's going to break. Uh, your car's going to stall, someone's not going to know what to do with it, so it needs to be towed and all those, all those funny things. So um, the next thing is it's a new technology. New technologies tend to fail uh, quite, a, quite a lot uh, during their market introduction phase. And uh, if you speak to the usual Tesla owner, they love their car, but it's, it's, it's quite a strenuous relationship there. Um, so um, it's a new technology. New technologies are fantastic for service business. And thirdly, I think, and this is just digging a little deeper, that we haven't even sort of scratched the surface of what it really takes to build a really good electric motor. And uh, we're not quite sure how many electric motors are actually going to end up in a vehicle. Is it just one like we have today? Is it maybe two? Is it maybe four? We don't know how these, all these motors will be connected. So there's a lot of new technology out there. And um, I believe in a, innovation. innovation is fantastic. And the other thing that we talked about is technical obsolescence, new technology. Um, is going to go very, very dynamically. And people are going to come back and are going to want an upgrade to their cars, uh, much more than they will want it today. So I see, uh, even in this transition phase, I see a lot of new business opportunities, really. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting point there, really. And it's a point, uh, something that just brings to mind, that uh, with Tesla, you'll forgive them for some of the, the issues that you're facing because of the, the buy-in to Tesla, the emotional side of Tesla, as it moves more and more to a mobility model where there's less emotion linked to the car, perhaps you'll be less forgiving uh, to mistakes and, uh, you know, and teething, teething problems. Mm. Uh, any questions from the, from the audience? Uh, question here from the front from the front, a man with a funny lot of hair on his face. Him or me, actually. <laughs> uh, Christopher Ludwig, Automotive Logistics. Uh, two questions. Uh, first to Christoph. You, you did sort of indicate that you weren't sure what Paris would have meant anyway in terms of the uh, agreement, agreement the, the climate, uh, sorry, the Paris Climate Accord. But what would you say uh, the US decision to pull out might mean looking forward for the automotive industry in terms of divergence in terms of the sectors and things. So this is a reflection, especially considering what China's planning as well from a government side, potentially. And then maybe a, a question also to Frank. Uh, to our glorious septed isle um, back in the UK uh, with Brexit and, and the aftermarket. Uh, obviously, the aftermarket in the UK is very vibrant. It's very flourishing. Would you, A, kind of agree with Christoph's point that the supply chain isn't so deeply rooted? Uh, is that different at all in the aftermarket? And, and secondly, what impacts might might we see in the, in, in the case of a, a hard Brexit uh, in the aftermarket? So perhaps Christoph first. Thank you. Um, well, what I think we're going to see is a lot more diversification and uh, in terms of what people want and in terms of regulatory requirements. Um, uh, this remark on the Paris Accord was that the automotive industry tried to ignore it for quite a while, <laughs> only when they understood that it really meant uh, for business and that politicians really mean it and that uh, the, ener the entire energy sector is moving in a straight line towards meeting the 2050 targets, only then they started to understand that it actually is something serious. Um, considering the US market, I think it's um, for the, at least for the avant-garde consumer, the, electric, the notion of an electric vehicle has now established such a fashion effect that it has developed its own industrial dynamic. Um, the average sort of short-sighted, more price-oriented buyer is not quite there yet. But I think the, the notion of an electric car has now, now has an emotional appeal. And brands cannot afford anymore to continue to disappoint their customers by not offering this kind of a technical option. I think it's, 
that it's, it's not quite off the tarmac, but I think the bird already has air under the wings and it's, it's, it's getting there. I believe there is an, an ongoing dynamic. Maybe it will be much more healthy in terms of industrialization, in terms of profitability, than these forced, induced type of market ramp ups that we may see in Europe and that certainly we're going to see in China. Yeah, your question regarding Brexit impact on our industry here. I see aftermarket a little bit different from OE and the production of parts. We have made internally some analysis and found parts crossing the border before they leave as a final product, the production, they cross seven times a European border. And if these parts are subject to a customs procedure, I think people will take a decision where to produce them finally. And uh, these things need to be sorted out. Regarding aftermarket, I think it's more relevant at the end what specifications and EU regulations uh, will be adapted in the UK. Uh, at the moment, we have one common market, but uh, in the future, we have probably different rules and different regulations and uh, this might differentiate the markets that parts which are sold or allowed to be sold in UK might not be allowed to enter the continent and uh, these things uh, will be sorted out I think in the next two or three years but uh, there might be an impact on the aftermarket yes okay a uh, question for me, again for you, Frank, really, is uh, um, the, the power of the suppliers. Uh, and you, you worked at a company, Bosch, who perhaps were an example of this, how you can be strong enough and big enough to be a required partner of the, of the car makers. I think it's something that the logistics service providers still feel there's a kind of master and servant relationship. Um, uh, and I think that perhaps some of the logistics service providers want to or should develop uh, and become strong enough partners that they become a requ that, that their company becomes a requirement. One of the complaints I hear from the, the logistics providers is um, they're, they're driven, the RFQs are, uh, are driven by the purchasing department, so it ends up going straight to price. The car makers sometimes tell me the logistics service providers allow themselves to be led by price. They should come up with new ideas and make themselves required partners for the, for the car makers, where the car maker, can, the, the logistics guy, might be able to say to the person, guys, we have to use this company because they're strong, they're different, they're innovative, they can invest. We want to work with them as opposed to just going for the lowest price. So I was wondering what advice you would give to a logistics provider to say, you know, become a strong partner uh, become you know, financially strong, innovative, whatever it is, so that you're a strong partner and a required partner, as opposed to just being a price-led uh, commodity almost. Good. Um, what happens at the moment? Uh, we saw in both presentations here that we are in a very volatile environment. Mm -hmm. And the key word is innovation. And I think Daimler made it very clear last week in the press, we want innovative suppliers. And this includes tier one as well as other ones. Yeah? I think innovation is the key word. And what we recognize at the moment, since we have a certain dependencies, tier one depend to 85% on OEM customers. This means if you are producing automotive parts, there are a couple of companies you can sell them, but uh, somehow the destiny is, <laughs> I think, being decided in one bucket. So, and with all the investments which are in front of us for automated driving, for connectivity, for electrification, and all these industry 4.0 things, we have these dependencies and therefore at the moment, tier one, as well as OEMs, need to be very close aligned regarding uh, their activities in the future. And meanwhile, if you look into electrification, if you invest in battery business, 
or you take such a decision, this is a dimension, and we know it from solar, if you invest two billion, probably a company survives if it fails or gets uh, maybe ruined by, by uh, Chinese subsidies somewhere. But if you invest in battery technology, we are not talking two billion, we are talking two digit billion. Mm. And uh, this can also, if this fails, this ruins a company. And uh, this is the edge of, of decisions where our industry is at the moment. And uh, this is uh, the, the magnitude alone which makes at the moment the link between tier one and OEM even stronger than what we had before. Okay, thank you. Well, we've obviously uh, overrun a little bit, but the presentations were very interesting, uh, very relevant, and actually exactly what we wanted to start off the conference about, you know, what's happening in the industry and the need and desire for change and innovation, and that's what's going to help your individual companies develop. Um, we talked about using the, using the, the app and, and voting on the app. So one of the questions that will be, the first question we'll be asking isn't a general survey, but after each session we'll be asking the question uh, about uh, what, did you think of, what did you think of each individual session. So that's going to be up on, if you're, on, if you're logged on to the app, that'll be the question we'll be asking now. Uh, is, you know, what did you think of the session and would you recommend it to people? We won't be posting the actual results of, the, uh, of this particular question uh, on the screen, uh, which is unfortunate for this first session because I actually think it, I, I'd like to think it was very highly rate, would have been very highly rated because the information was very interesting, very well presented. So therefore, I'd like to thank our two presenters who started off the Automotive Logistics Europe conference so well for us this morning. Thank you very much, gentlemen. For the next session, the, the, we'll be splitting into two streams, uh, looking at uh, changing and flexible networks. Uh, this room, session A, will be on the inbound side, uh, and in the other second stream room, we'll be on finished vehicle logistics. So again, you know, choose which one you want to go into. But otherwise, join us for the coffee breaks outside. Visit our sponsors and their stands. Uh, continue not, your networking, and we'll see you back in whichever room at 11 o'clock. Thank you.